Today on the Matt Wall Show, the DNC convention kicks off with a call to unite America. But what does unity look like in the mind of a Democrat? Apparently, it, it includes rioting and looting and destruction. So we'll talk about all that. Also, five headlines, including a college professor who's finally uncovered the sinister nature of coloring books. So you need to hear about this. And finally, in our daily cancellation, we'll talk about the, the hate crime uh, claim made weeks ago that got a lot of attention at the time but hasn't been mentioned by the media or law enforcement since. I wonder why. So all of that is on the way, but we start here. The Democratic Convention, as mentioned, kicks off tonight. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm very excited. There are, there are really only a few things I'd rather do than watch the DNC convention. For example, um, stick my face in a blender. I'd rather do that, but uh, my blender isn't working right now, so that's good news for my face, I guess. Anyway, I, I really I, I took note of the theme of the convention, um, which is this, if you can believe it. The theme is uniting America. Now, as I've argued extensively in recent months, uniting unity is, is nothing more than an empty slogan if it is advocated without context. You want unity? Okay, great. But what do you mean? Who is you uniting? And, and around what? And why? And to what end? Um, that's certainly the question you would ask if some weirdo on the street came up to you and said, hey, friend, let's unite. You'd hear that and you'd say, uh, what do you mean by unite? Is that some sort of sexual euphemism? Uh, you'd need more information before you agree to it, is the point. So when I hear Democrats call for unity, I have the same question. I'm pretty sure they don't mean it sexually, though you never know with these people, but what do they mean? Um, and, 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 and that question takes on new urgency when you consider, for example, the words of the squad's Ringo, uh, Ayanna Presley, being interviewed on MSNBC this weekend. Here's what she had to say. Listen to this. I'm looking to the public. You know, this is as much about public outcry and organizing and mobilizing and applying pressure so that this GOP-led Senate and that these governors that continue to carry water for this administration, putting the American people in, in harm's way, um, turning a deaf ear to the needs of our families and our communities, hold them accountable. Well, make the phone call, send the email, show up. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there's unrest in our lives. And unfortunately, there's plenty to go around. She wants more unrest in the streets. She's not satisfied yet. Presley sitting on her comfortable perch far away from the burned out neighborhoods, the boarded up stores, the looting, the rioting, the assaults, the murder, the children in cancer treatment centers laying in their beds in terror as they listen to the gunshots, as we talked about last week. Presley, insulated from all of that, insulated from the chaos and death and destruction, wants more of it, wants it to continue. That's her unity. And uh, she's not alone in the Democrat Party, not at all. In fact, her view is mainstream, is more than mainstream, is the only acceptable or only accepted view, in fact. Another example, a few days ago, BLM activists stormed a suburban neighborhood in Seattle and demanded that um, white people give up their homes. Listen to that. Give up your house, give black people back their homes. Thank you. They're sitting there comfortably. You notice how having a good job is literally a joke to these people. You guys have jobs at Amazon where you support your families. <laughs> Losers. But what you have here really is a gang of overgrown children, a gang of clowns and losers demanding that they simply be given what other people have worked for. Now, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was recently asked about asked about this, uh, this, this incident by reporters, asked if she condemns what these BLM children are doing. And here's what she said. This is the quote. 
Since this is happening in Seattle, I don't have as close of a view on what's happening. Of course, I represent New York's 14th Congressional District, so I don't know the details of the protests that are going on. But I think what's really important is that we make sure people are safe, and it's important for us to enact legislation and policy that actually addresses the core reason behind all of this kind of disruption that's happening. Uh, and then she added, uh, until we do that, this is going to keep occurring, whether we want it to or not. Whether we want it to or not. Well, she wants it to. That much is clear. Um, now, let's, let's look at some other examples of this unrest in the street that the, Democrat, that the Democrat Party explicitly endorses and encourages. This is from last night in Portland. A BLM mob caused a, a man to crash his truck, then knocked him unconscious and, le and left him bleeding in the street. So that's, that's what happened. Let's, let's back up a little bit and see how this all began. I'm going to play that video for you. Um, you'll see the mob swarm a truck. The truck drives away and in the chaos ends up crashing. So we'll watch that part first. Watch. Back up, back up, back up. Okay, so uh, so you see that, and then they go to the car, the guy gets out or is dragged out, at and I'm not sure which one, and at which point he is, he's held hostage by, the, by these people. Detained is the word I've, I've seen used in the media. They detained him as if they're police officers, and then they did this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I ain't trying to hurt no one down there. What you mean you're not trying to hurt nobody? Shut the up, nigga. What the fuck is you talking about? You right here. What the fuck is you talking about? What the is you talking about? You weren't trying to hurt nobody. I'm not getting in your face, brother. Not you, bro. I ain't trying to hurt nobody. And after all of that, of course, they robbed his truck because uh, why not? All in the name of justice, okay, just so you know, and because of, you know, George Floyd or whatever. Now, again, the Democrat Party explicitly supports this. It's not just that they won't condemn it, which they won't, of course, but that they, as you heard from Ringo, they positively advocate for it. So we go back to our original question, what do they mean by unity? They want to unite America. Well, how so? Unite us all in our shared affection for beating white men unconscious? Is that the idea? Well, sort of, yeah. For Democrats, when they say unite, if you do not share their ideology and affirm it absolutely, and especially if you're not, an approved, if you're not in an approved vic victim group, then they're not looking to unite with you, but rather to unite around a shared hatred of you. For the left and Democrats, the uniting principle is one of vengeance and hatred, and it's vengeance against and hatred of you. That is their unity. Why do you think they won't stand for the anthem? Because it's too inclusive. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free, the home of the brave? That's far too unifying. It includes too many people. That's their beef with it when it comes down to it. 
So a unity convention for Democrats is like a, a dinner party for cannibals. They may invite you to the table, but it's only because you're on the menu. Unity for them is highly specific, highly exclusionary, and anyone who doesn't pass the litmus test is an other, a villain, and they are deserving of any fate that befalls them, including being knocked unconscious in the street. That is the Democrat Party. That is what it stands for. That's the vision it has for this country, and we have seen the vision increasingly realized recently. Voters now just have to decide if they want more of that. Now let's get to our five headlines. Well, the show today is uh, supported by Rad Power Bikes. You know, getting getting out and about, is, is, that's something, especially when the weather is nice like this, that you want to be able to do. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it starts to start cooling down a little bit. We get into the fall, great time to be out and about. Well, that's what you need an electric bike for. Uh, whether, you know, you want a new way to get around town or out in nature, even with the kids in tow, whatever it is, you've got to try a Rad Power Bike. Just give it a try and you'll be, you'll be hooked, trust me. It's a cross between a traditional bike and a moped, but it doesn't require a special driver's license or anything like that. You can go up to 20 miles per hour without pedaling, so you can get out and about without uh, getting all sweaty. And so that means they're great for you know commuting to work, so you're not showing up at work sweaty and disgusting. I think your, your coworkers were, will uh, appreciate that. Or you can haul groceries. Like I said, you can even have kids on the back. Unlike other e-bikes, they're actually affordable. Plus, to show appreciation for those that service, Rad Power Bikes is offering $100 off all e-bike purchases for active um, ex-military, first responders, teachers, and students. Dedicated U.S.-based customer support seven days a week to any uh, to answer any questions that you might have. So they're there for you. This um, product is, I mean, what I like about it is that it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's also really practical. It's something that you can use and have fun while you use it. Rad Power Bikes offers flexible financing for as low as 0% APR. And right now, as a limited time offer, get a free accessory with the purchase of a bike. That's right, get a free gift up to $100 in value and free shipping to the lower 48 states. To get this special offer, text the word BIKE to 64000. That's BIKE to 64000. Text BIKE to 64000. All right, number one, let me start with this. Um, first of all, can I just say at the outset that I, I, I love controversies as much as the next guy, more than the next guy probably. Uh, I live for it. It's great. People fighting, disagreeing, getting all offended about stuff. I'm into it. I really am. But every once in a while, a controversy pops up that I just can't get into. I can't bring myself to care. And we are in one of those news cycles right now, and it's really killing me. This Postal Service stuff. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the Postal Service and mail-in voting. And I, I, I can't even continue talking about it right now because I might fall asleep in the middle of, of speaking. That's how boring it is to me. I've tried working myself up about it. I really have. I've, I've practiced it. I was in the, mor the mirror this morning practicing, like getting angry. Ah, this, the postal service. Ah, I'm so angry. And I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I tried. So um, here I am left out while people care about this for 37 seconds but it's a torturous 37 seconds because I feel so excluded. But all of that said, I did appreciate this at least. This was um, the, the closest I could come to being interested, which is right here. Uh, you can see the footage, a protest at the Postmaster General's house. These are people who are concerned that their ability to vote by mail is being blocked by Trump and the general. I don't know if he's a real general, but uh, anyway, that's what I call him. But the funny thing, of, of course, is that they want to do mail-in voting because they don't want to have to go out in public and vote because they're afraid of the virus, yet they're out in public in a large group protesting that they might have to be out in public in a much smaller group to vote. So it's just, it, it, it's, it's, this is really, this is part of the scientific discovery process that's been very interesting, uh, really, really fascinating, frankly, to learn more and more about this virus each day. Because at first we thought, you know, it's a virus, uh, it, it can infect anyone really, you know, certain demographics are not as susceptible, of course, like children, but, you know, you, you figure like, it's, it's sort of, it, it's just a virus, you know, that, and, and that's what you think. But then, then we learned that it really only infects you at church, at school, uh, or during anti-lockdown protests, or while voting in person. 
but it doesn't infect you at Walmart, at Target, at BLM protests, or while protesting voting in person. So like I said, fascinating stuff. And, and this is why I just love science. Uh, I love learning things like this. It, it really is just a lot of fun. Number two, here's a better controversy. This is more my speed. Father James Martin, a Jesuit, of course, is going to be speaking at the DNC, uh, I think on Thursday. Martin, despite being a Catholic priest, is known for his far-left activism. Uh, and in fact, as a Catholic, it pains me to say that we, we might be reaching a point where I don't need to say despite anymore in that sentence. But anyway, um, th this is the guy, for example, who sent out a tweet after George Floyd died, asking for George Floyd to intercede for us in heaven. He, he literally tried to canonize George Floyd via tweet. He's also a big LGBT activist, big into leftist causes in general. So on one level, it makes sense for him to speak at the DNC. But on another level, he's allegedly a Catholic and allegedly a priest. Um, and you can't really be either of those in good standing and have anything to do with the modern Democrat Party. The modern Democrat Party is expressly opposed to Catholic teaching, Christian teaching, biblical teaching. And there are, of course, many examples of this, but we don't need to go any further than the Democrat Party's stated official position that children in the womb at any stage and for any reason can be executed. So Martin should be defrocked and excommunicated for this. He won't be, of course, but uh, he should be. Number three, a few weeks ago, I had to cancel Ryan Reynolds because he issued a public apology for getting married at a wedding venue. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you almost, we, we might be reaching a point where I could just stop the sentence there, where you're going to have celebrities apologizing at least heterosexual celebrities apologizing for getting married in general. Uh, I, we, 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 might, we might be reaching that point, but we're not there yet. So he, got ma he, he apologized for, for getting married at a, at a wedding venue that used to be a slave plantation 150 years ago. Uh, he apologized for that for some reason. Because apparently now, you know, it, it, you, you can't, uh, even if a place is a very pretty venue and there's a lot of great scenery, if bad stuff happened there a century and a half ago, you're not allowed to get married there. Um, so, you know, before you get married anywhere or really go do anything anywhere, like go for a picnic, anything, um, you need to research, do Wikipedia, go to Google, maybe do an archaeological dig to see what happened. And then you can have your picnic. Um, but now Reynolds is begging to be canceled again, really. The premier of British Columbia, for some reason, held a press conference begging Ryan Reynolds and Seth Rogen to help him fight the coronavirus. Because, of course, in a medical crisis, the people you want to call are the guy from Deadpool and the guy from Knocked Up. Uh, here, here's, here's the premiere. I've been talking about the importance of making sure that younger uh, demographics are hearing the message. This is a, a call out to Deadpool right now. Uh, Ryan, we need your help up here. Uh, get in touch with us. Uh, my number's uh, on the internet. Uh, Seth Rogan, another outstanding British Columbian. We need to communicate with people who aren't hearing us. The two of you alone could help us in that regard. There's a host of other options available, and we're working as hard as we can to enlist a number of prominent British Columbians and prominent Canadians to help get that message through to the demographic that clearly isn't hearing our message. Now, Reynolds, in true cringe fashion, responded with, for some reason, a fake voicemail, uh, and this is what that sounded like. Oh, uh, hey, uh, Premier Horgan, Ryan Reynolds here. Uh, I got your message about the thing. Uh, I'm not sure it's a great idea, frankly. Uh, people don't, I don't think they want medical advice from guys like me. No, sir. Um, unless it's plastic surgery, which a lot of people don't know this, but I used to be Hugh Jackman. Uh, you know, in young folks in BC, yeah, they're, they're partying, um, which is, of course, dangerous. Uh, and they probably don't know that that thousands of young people aren't just getting sick from coronavirus, that they're, they're also dying from it too. Uh, and of course it's the, terrible that it affects our most vulnerable. You know, BC is, that's home to some of the coolest older people on earth. I mean, David Suzuki, did, he lives there. My mom, I mean, she doesn't want to be cooped up in her apartment all day. She wants to be out there cruising Kitsilano Beach looking for some young 30-something Abercrombie burnout to go full Mrs. Robinson on. She is insatiable. But here's the thing. Um, I hope that young people in BC don't kill my mom 
frankly, uh, or David Suzuki or each other. I, I, let's not I, let's not kill anyone. I think that's reasonable. Uh, and you know, but I, I just I I don't think that I'm the guy to deliver this message. I love parties. I mean, the the, the, the my favorite thing to do is just you know sit alone in my room with a glass of gin and the first 32 seasons of Gossip Girl. Well, that's a party. Threw my shoulder out the last time I did that. Mm. No one is going to kill your mother, Ryan, you paranoid lunatic. How, people are partying, okay. Um, if your mom's not going to those parties, then she should be all right. Uh, you know, if she's going out and, if, if, you know, if she's practicing social distancing, wearing the mask, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I don't think they're going to kill your mom. I think, I think it should be really okay. Uh, especially if she's out on the beach, out in, out in the, you know, open air, keeping a distance. I think everything will be fine. Um, number four, here's a, a report from the New York Post. It says, uh, Twitter is raging over a supposed call to cancel Genghis Khan, all prompted by a woman who had merely pointed out that the fearless 12th century Mongol conqueror had also killed an awful lot of people. Uh, this is tweeted from user Priya27, said Genghis Khan did to Central Asia what Islamic invaders did to India, maybe worse. He single-handedly killed 11% of the world population at the time, yet some want to glorify him as a hero and con- conqueror. That's your personal choice, but objectively, Genghis Khan was a barbarian. I, I saw these tweets. Now, this is this was tweeted out. Uh, I thought it was some interesting facts and points that were made. Uh, that the 11% of the world population figure, I'd have to, you know, that's that seems rather incredible. I'd have to go check that one myself. But anyway, that's uh, he certainly killed a lot of people. We know that. And uh, and then people were mocking this though, as if she was trying to cancel Genghis Khan posthumously. Um, I don't think that was the point at all. You know, I, 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 I think actually at least one thing you could take from this is that it turns out, uh, in fact, that white people did not invent wars of conquest, did not invent genocide, uh, did not invent slavery. All that stuff had been happening in the world, has been happening in the world for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is just one example. I don't know if that was her point, but that is that is one historical fact that you can take from this and to put things in context. And I think especially these days, that is some useful context to have. And finally, um, let's see here. This is a report in the Daily Wire. I actually haven't read through this yet. I'm just grabbing it based on the headline. So let's dive in. It says, in a piece originally titled, There's a Sinister Reason Coloring Books Are So Popular in Quarantine, a professor who teaches the the history of art, ideas, and technology at Stanford University and also writes for The Guardian and Vogue, posits a unique take. What if the recent popularity of coloring books comes not from the creativity they purportedly inspire, but from the submission they induce? In the, in the piece, later retitled The Dark Forgotten History of Coloring Books, uh, Emmanuel Lugoli asserts, this, after all, has been their mission from the start. It may be lost to the fans of coloring books that their success peaked in the 19th century when such publications taught children how to behave. And obedience seems to be what many of us crave in these pandemic days. Um, Noting, yeah, of course that it may be lost to the fans of color. Well, the fans of coloring books, for the most part, are seven years old. So yes, I'm sure this is lost on them. I mean, my seven-year-old has never asked me about the the history of coloring books. I'd be a little freaked out if she did. Noting that the, the Little Folks painting book, often described as the first coloring book, which depicts in its last story a brother and sister who wish to fly away from their boring, secluded life, um, Lugley asks, uh, does this sum up, sum up what coloring books are about? Stay within the lines. And then, all right, it goes on. So, okay, this is, this is as crazy as I hoped it would be, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Uh, and I like where it's going. My only concern is that it doesn't go quite far enough. Yes, coloring books teach submission, um, so there's that. But what about? I mean, they also teach a form of blackface and cultural appropriation. Because think about it: you're taking these white characters usually and coloring them, much like Ralph Northam. You, you're taking these pasty white uh, figures and putting artificial color on them. So I think that this encourages children to perform blackface. Uh, not only that, but Coloring books are 
transphobic because for for some reason that I'm I'm be, oh because they they trivialize body dysmorphia by allowing you to change the physical characteristics of the characters in the coloring book so easily thereby cheapening the lived experience of dysmorphic individuals got it okay so you can add on to this I, this, this this so i'm a little bit disappointed by this professor yeah you found one offensive aspect of coloring books but what about everything else so you got to go you you, you really got to go for the gusto on these things um, all right, let's get to our daily cancellation. But before we do, I want to tell you about our friends at Eero. Um, you know, it can be it can be kind of frustrating if there's that. And, and I, I've got more than one spot in my house, to be honest. Before I started using Eero, where you get maybe one or two spots in your house where the Wi-Fi really doesn't work that well, or you might have the one spot where it works the best, and so you have to be huddled in that corner using your your uh, your laptop or whatever. These days, your house isn't just your home. It's an office. It's a school. It's a movie theater. It's a restaurant. Everything all at once. All these activities and more put a strain on your Wi-Fi. It's not good enough um, if it's only good in a room or two. You want it to reach the entire house. You need solid Wi-Fi in your whole house so everyone isn't working on top of each other. That's why you need Eero. Eero, an Amazon company, covers your, your whole home with fast, reliable Wi-Fi inside and out. Rooms with bad to no Wi-Fi. If you have dropouts on your patio, you want to go outside and use... The computer, Eero makes every square foot of your house and your property usable by eliminating poor coverage and dead spots. You'll have a consistently strong signal where, wherever you need it. It's that simple. Um, I've been using it myself, and uh, and you know I've I've found especially where we kind of live out, you know, um, in 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 an area where. A lot of people have to struggle with the Wi-Fi connection, but ever since I've used Eero, you know, it's fast. I can use it anywhere. I can go out on the porch um, during a nice day and use the computer, and I've got that, the Wi-Fi working. We're asking a lot of our Wi-Fi. Eero can help yours do more. Go to Eero.com slash Walsh and enter code Walsh to check out to get free next day shipping with your order. That's E-E-R-O.com slash Walsh, code Walsh at checkout to get your Eero delivered with free next day shipping. Eero.com slash Walsh, code Walsh. Well, this is another one of those cancellations that I wish I didn't have to do. Uh, this is the case for all of my cancellations. In fact, to everyone that I've canceled, you should know that it hurts me more than it hurts you. I am, at heart, a truly compassionate and tolerant man. So it grieves me when you are so lame and stupid that I have to cancel you. Deeply, deeply grieves me. And never has that been truer than right now. Today, I must cancel um, the police department of Madison, Wisconsin. I am a supporter of the police. I, I hate the defund the police movement. I've spent a lot of time, especially recently, defending uh, the police against unfair attacks. But the Madison police must be canceled even so, and I'll explain why. Um, it stems from a case that I've been following on the show, even if nobody else really has. I, I follow it because I am of the increasingly unique and perhaps bizarre opinion that the truth matters. And in this day and age when lies and misinformation and propaganda and false narratives are helping to fuel the rapid destruction of our society, the truth has never mattered more, I would say. So let's review briefly. Uh, the case is that of Althea Bernstein, 18-year-old Madison, Wisconsin resident. Seven weeks ago, on June 24th, Althea Bernstein claims she was driving through the city at 1 a.m., stopped at a red light, uh, she thinks, around West Gorham and State Street in, in Madison, and she says that at that moment, four white men um, approached her vehicle. Two were wearing floral shirts and jeans. The other two were dressed in all black and wearing masks. Somehow she knew those two were white also. I don't know how, but that's not the point right now. She says they yelled a racial slur at her, then squirted some lighter fluid on her, and then threw a lighter into the car, which set her face on fire. And she says that she then drove away in shock, eventually made it home, went to the hospital, called the police the next day. Now, the media went wild with this story at first. It made headlines in all the major publications. It was used to support the claim of a hate crime epidemic in America. Meghan Markle uh, called Althea and, and spoke with her for 40 minutes, consoling and offering advice, because of course, Meghan has had to deal with hate crimes herself, like the time that the maid left streaks on the window after washing it. Uh, so she suffered quite a bit in her life. The point is, and, and, and this was a, a pretty big deal at the time. And, and, and of course, it would be if it happened. Four flamethrowing racist 
thugs wandering the street of Madison with lighter fluid, literally, literally setting black women on fire. That's a huge deal. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable, you might say. Of course, there were always some weird aspects of this story, such as like every aspect of the story. It was the middle of the night. She's at a stoplight. These guys show up with lighter fluid. What were they doing? Just hanging out in the street, waiting for a racial minority to stop? They doused her with lighter fluid, and then and then and then the lighter, and then and then she drove away. Why did she drive away at some point in the middle of this whole process, which must have taken several seconds at least to unfold? And and how did the lighter even stay lit as it was thrown? Not to mention, where is that lighter now? Does she have it? It must have landed in the car, right? And well, look at the the picture of her of her injuries. This is strange. She says that she, that her face was on fire. Is that what burn marks look like after your face has been ignited? I don't know. Maybe. It's never happened to me, admittedly. But it doesn't look exactly like what you would expect. But then, where are the witnesses to this attack? It happened in the middle of the city, a busy part of town. Sure, it was the middle of the night, but even so. Did no one else see this happen? Did no one else have a a run-in with this group of violent, fire-wielding Nazis? Did they come out at 1 a.m. with a lighter fluid, attack one person, then disappear forever? Surely someone else saw them. Surely they had a run-in with someone else other than Althea Bernstein. And what about cameras? Red light cameras, security cameras, cell phone cameras? Surely this was caught on tape somewhere. And even if not, surely these guys, this group, are on video walking to the scene or or, or leaving it. It just seems like this should be a very, very easy case to crack. You should have the fingerprints on the lighter that must have landed in Althea's car. You should have some kind of video. You should have some kind of witness. Unless these were special ops Klansmen who rappelled down from a helicopter then vanished into the night like highly trained Navy SEALs, there would be lots of evidence left behind. And yet, oddly enough, we've heard nothing about this case since it happened. No video has been released. No witnesses have come forward. No one, so far as I know, on social media has said, hey, I I saw these guys. I I thought it was weird how they were lugging lighter fluid around at 1 a.m. Nothing. Well, I shouldn't say nothing. Amanda Presser Jockin with the Daily Wire has the update, uh, such as it is, quoting from a report in the Wisconsin State Journal, which reached out to the Madison police last week. And here's what spokesman Joel Despain said as an update. This is the latest we've gotten. Uh, the, the, the update is, there is nothing new to release at this time. That's it. That's all they said. Okay. Well, thanks, Joel. But how is there no new information? It's been seven weeks. Did you check the tapes? Did you talk to witnesses? There's got to be some information there, right? And if you check the tapes and talk to people and witnesses and and came up with nothing, then that also is information, really important information. But you say nothing, no information one way or another. You've been investigating this for seven weeks and you know absolutely nothing at all about it. Really? How? Here's another weird thing about this. There was a confirmed arson attack that same night. Only it was carried out not by racists and floral shirts, uh, but by protesters at the city county building, which, when you know it, is only about a mile from where Althea says this happened. Is there a connection? Who knows? But you know, you could see how a person involved in an arson attack might get burned, and then how they might not want to tell people that's how they got burned. In fact, the police released an image of one of the people involved in the attack on the building that night. Um, notice how they released the footage or an an image of this right away, yet seven weeks later, and there's no image of Althea's attackers. But anyway, look what he's using there. It almost looks like lighter fluid. I don't know. Look, I'm just working through this. It's not like we're given anything to go on here. So I really don't know. I'm just sort of trying to figure it out. But it seems to me this is where we're left and why the Madison Police Department is canceled. You know, when it comes down to it, Either racist psychopaths who tried to burn a woman alive in the middle of the street are still out there in the community hunting for their next victim, and the Madison Police Department is doing nothing to stop them and hasn't released any footage of them or even a composite sketch or anything else and is thus putting lives in danger through their inaction, or this is a hoax, a really deranged hoax and possibly a hoax concocted to cover for another crime. And the police department knows this or strongly suspects it, but isn't telling us and is covering for the hoaxer. 
Those really seem to be the only plausible scenarios, and I'd say that one is far more plausible than the other. So, either way, whatever the truth is here, the Madison Police Department is not being honest, is not being straightforward, is trying to cover something, is not doing their duty, and thus is canceled. Hate to do it, but they are. They've left me no choice. Uh, And I still, for one, would like to know the truth about this case. I don't know about you, but I would like to know one way or another. We'll leave it there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. 